Ideas change culture, but structural change really changes culture. That's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna to look at how the supply chain world in which we're used to living is changing. Perhaps you have ordered something and it's taken really way too long to arrive or your favorite product is out of stock at the supermarket. These are just some examples of the impact of supply chain issues at the moment. Gabby Hinsliff writes in The Guardian, after a disorienting year and a half under the shadow of a pandemic, we now seem to be entering a new era of uncertainty and unpredictability. Over time, that can't help but leave a mark. We're going to talk today about a kind of individualism which has grown up in the last 20 years, facilitated by a world which promises you everything to arrive at your door at the click of a button. But what if that paradigm is shifting? What if we're moving from individualism to interconnectivity? What does this mean for us as leaders? What does this mean for the contemporary church? We're going to explore that and more, plus perhaps discover what new car I have bought. Also something new today. We'll be sending out an email to those of you who have subscribed to our mailing list. We know many of you are interested in some of the articles, the books, the resources that we list in each episode. So we're going to be sending you a bunch of stuff that we refer to today and some more things which helps you understand the subject that we're talking about today. If you'd like to join our mailing list, please go to rebuilders.co and you can sign up there. Enjoy today's episode. Hi, welcome to Rebuilders. My name is Liddy. I'm here with Mark Sayers. How are you? I am doing well. Spring is in the air and uh, here in Melbourne and sun's out. So yes. it's a lovely, lovely day. Yep. And you're wearing <coughs> stripes on camera, which is an interesting yes, choice. Yes, sorry. I do. I, I remember seeing a documentary when I was a, a boy about people in France and there was a woman who had this T-shirt on and she had this rule which I sometimes think of, where she said, the French rule of fashion, I don't know if she was just making this up, is you should dress up like a character. So she said, when I wear this T-shirt, I'm dressed as a sailor. So this morning I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm not really dressed as a sailor. I'm dressed as a, a guy who was a sailor, but through strike action now finds himself <laughs> having to work as an Uber driver in Lyon. What's his name? Patrice. <laughs> he also doesn't pay his taxes. Come on, Patrice. Can I talk to Patrice today <coughs> instead of Mark? We could do a whole series of <laughs> <laughs> podcast uh, interviews with non-existent characters. We could. It would go under the comedy section of Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Well, what, what's this currently? <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure. <coughs> Daniel, what character are you dressed up as today? Um, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. You look exactly like you've got the flannel shirt, you've got the <laughs> headband on, you're carrying a guitar. <laughs> Pity we haven't got a camera on you too, yeah. uh, you know. It's yeah. a real shame. Mm. Um, I've also gone with the ocean, ocean yeah, you've theme. you've got an ocean yeah. shell. I've got a shell. A shell. Petroleum company. <laughs> yep. We said that we're not sponsored but maybe we mm. are. Yeah, big oil money behind this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Oh, How is Shell going so, at this time? This, this. Well, <laughs> this. that's a great segue. <laughs> yeah. Oil, supply chains, great segue for what we talk about today. Oh, yes. Go on. So one of the things that I've been sort of following quite closely is supply chain disruptions. We may sound a little bit boring to people, um, but which is something which is big in the news and uh, uh, we're going to look at it today and explore what is going on in the world of supply chains, what does this mean, how does it affect us, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So overall it's, it's kind of like that there's a structural change yes. happening. So I think, I think probably a great way to start to think about today's episode is lots of people probably listen to this, um, leaders and people who like to follow culture and um, we're used to the idea of cultural change, that mm. people may actually begin to think that um, ideas are changing in the culture, how do we deal with them? And so a lot of that thinking around how things change is actually all the cultural change when our ideas change. But it's really interesting, we're entering into a, a period of not just cultural change, but actual structural change. Mm -hmm. So an actual structural change in how the world operates. 
And I think this is really important to grasp because often structural change actually is what drives cultural change. Hmm. Uh, often structural change then creates new ideas and new thinking, mm -hmm. means old uh, structures pass away and therefore new thinking has to occur. And so really we're in this moment and we're in this grey zone moment which we've been talking about. And grey zone is not just about a cultural change, it's also about a great structural change that's occurring in the world. Can you give us any like just quick examples throughout history, like last couple, say, yeah. 100, 200 years of where structural changes. Yeah. So, for example, um, you know, if you look at how people understood themselves as individuals, um, you know, there's a profound change in how individuals understood themselves at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Hmm. Um, if you look at something like the feudal system, which had been, you know, uh, part of um, European history for, for many centuries, people saw themselves existing in this great chain of being and almost there was this sort of hierarchy that existed from the peasant, mm. um, you know, who's working a field to the uh, perhaps their overseer to, you know, the, the king they may have been working for or, or lord or aristocracy and that all went up to the priesthood and even, you know, people sort of saw that going to the spiritual realm, this great chain of being that people saw in the world. When the Industrial Revolution comes, there's this great structural change because the economy changes, agriculture changes, you know, you have manufacturing in the cities, people move to the cities. This changes the idea of the parish church. Um, where the parish church was this organising principle for people, and all of a sudden you you know you have this uh, element of of ch people moving into cities, disconnected from land, tribe, who they're part of, and uh, uh, that changes the ideas. You see people start mm. to think about themselves in very different ways. So that's, that's just one example of what happens. Yeah. Okay. And so if you if you look at uh, our context, our current context, you would say that we are still very much, or we have been very much operating as individuals. Yes. Um, the term radical individualism is something we talk about yeah. a lot. We, ourselves, we mm. are the king or mm. the, the priest, our own mm. sort of, our own hierarchy. We mm. put ourselves above everyone else. So you're putting forward that this is changing? Yes. Okay. So I think, I think you know, one thing is individualism has been, you know, is the defining ideology of our day mm -hmm. and it's really an organising principle. And I think like if you look at charting individualism, you, know, you can chart it for, you know, a few centuries but it sort of takes on different forms in every age. Mm. And I think what I'm really interested in and what I'd love to talk about today is the idea of really how individualism has been shaped really in the last sort of few decades, maybe 20, 30 years, even the last 10 years really. We've had this sort of almost expanding autonomy as individuals and really this has been shaped by the structure of the world. And if you think about the structure of the world, um, the world has been in this phase really, you know, for the last sort of 20 years of just sort of continual growth. You know, we had things like the global financial crisis, um, but really the message of the world has been that you're a consumer um, and the options for the consumer have only grown mm -hmm. over the last 20, 30 years. You go back 30, 40 years, it was not normal for people to take overseas holidays. Uh, it was very expensive. People couldn't afford it. Even interstate travel on planes was actually expensive. To buy something, a book from overseas, um, was unthinkable. Um, you went to your local bookstore. Yeah. Um, so we now live in this world where people have all these options. You know, just think about like vinyl. Like people, I've got friends who are you know ordering you know a vinyl rare issue from Holland. Do you know what I mean? And they can just mm. order on their phone and arrive in the house in a couple of weeks. You know, to Australia. And so what this sort of world has done, this world of heaps of options, consumerism, just not just going to a store anymore, but being delivered to your house. Um, this idea of streaming any kind of television you want mm. through Netflix to, you know, your smart TV, being able to look up any moment on YouTube uh, that you want, being able to just sort of fly around the world. All of this has been shaped by a particular structure that the world has been in mm -hmm. for the last couple of decades. And a lot of people don't really think about how this has actually shaped our ideology, but it has. And so there's one argument that people um, make, apologists make for a uh, – you know, a sort of a world created for, uh, by God, which is called the finely tuned universe, the mm. idea that, you know, if there's a few little dimensions of gravity off or heat, you know, humans would be unable to exist. In some ways, that's what the economy has been like in the yeah. last um, sort of 10, 20 years. Mm. We've had these factors which are not normal. So for one, we've had extremely low interest rates, which meant that money is cheap. You can borrow money to, you know, get houses and, and you can borrow money uh, for a personal loan. We've also had this time where we've had the China um, move from sort of the late 70s into this capitalist period, really. I mean, it's still in name communist, but it's been this capitalist 
growth as moving from really a sort of um, almost agricultural culture into this great manufacturing mm. beast of a country. And what that's meant is that there's heaps of cheap stuff. So people's wages haven't gone up, but there's cheaper money to borrow. Plus there's also all this stuff made in China. And what that means is computers, um, you know, all these items that we buy can be made really cheaply. Mm. Now, the other thing that's happened in the West too is that because we're in this global economy, it's meant that manufacturing is happening elsewhere. So it yeah. means that the stuff that uh, used to cost a lot to make here because you had to pay workers' wages and pay them fairly now is actually happens in other countries. So really what this has done, it's almost created this sort of hidden world of this modern economy that almost operates in the background that we don't think about. Press the button on the Amazon, it's going to arrive at my house. I don't think about the process of how it gets to us. Yes. And this, I think, facilitates a kind of individualism that not many people have explored. This is actually accentuated radical individualism. Mm. And particularly if you are, say, in your 30s, um, like I think of you guys, um, your adult lives have really been, uh, you know, come of age in a time where everything's at your fingertips. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. There's a quote um, I want to read by the historian Aisha Ramachandran. Um, who says that few ideas have become so thoroughly associated with the emergence of modernity as that is a, of a globalized, interconnected, secular world. The phrase modern world has in, become, has in fact become a shorthand for a global environment characterized by scientific rationalism, large scale economic networks and agnostic skepticism. So just talk about the secular modern world. Now, what's interesting is, you know, we probably are used to the idea of globalization. We're used to her talk about secularism, but she also adds two extra few terms in there, interconnected and large scale economic networks. Now, a lot of people haven't put those two together. Mm. That part of the reason that secularism flourishes in certain places is because behind it is this almost hidden realm where you can get all this stuff, get it really easily and therefore, the myth you can buy is that the world is this place where you're not going to encounter discomfort. Everything's going to be very comfortable. That the default setting of life is that you're going to be happy and your, your needs and wants and desires are going to be met really easily at the touch of a button at your house. And that's going to happen smoothly. So, the world is working for you. Mm. And this creates then an implicit theological worldview that has underpinned a particular intensification of individualism that we've experienced in the last sort of 10 to 20 years. But it's changing. So, okay. Um, up the top, you, you spoke about supply chain disruption. Um, I'm interested in seeing how you're tethering these, yes. these two things together. Can I give an example of yeah, a, yeah. a supply chain disruption that – has <laughs> disrupted my a very important individual need that I have, um, which I don't. Um, I ordered some coasters on the sixteenth. No, on the sixteenth of September they were shipped. A coaster is a universal word. Is that an Australian word? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. A little thing you put a glass or a cup. Yeah. On, on your so yes. arguably, I should have like something underneath my cup well, to mark the table. So it doesn't <clears throat> mark the table. Yeah. Um, I believe it's an American store that I ordered them from, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I received an email the other day asking, you know, for my feedback on the product. I haven't received it. And I mm. went back and had a look at uh, the the tracking and it's basically just been stopped multiple times mm. in its delivery mm. process. So I'm not even sure quite where it is at the moment, mm. maybe being put onto a container but that was back on September the 16th that it was shipped mm -hmm. and ordinarily it would arrive by now. Mm -hmm. So I am in need of coasters. <laughs> my cups are marking my tables. Well, to add to another example for, for me is um, we uh, discovered our car needs to be replaced. That's not going to last much longer. Yes. Um, we've never bought an, or never, I've never bought a new car. Um, and uh, although people, you know, remember my mythical <laughs> mythical uh, Mitsubishi Mirage that was hail damaged, um, which you know people loved. Um, but so bought a new car, um, bought it on the phone because we're in lockdown. Yes. Um, and I bought, because I'm a deep, deeply committed to the prosperity uh, theology gospel, uh, prosperity, prosperity gospel, a, a, a Camry, Toyota Camry. Toyota Camry. Um, 
<laughs> with just um, nothing says success like a Camry. I, I feel it's it's a hot hot vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which deeply speaks to my personality um, because I have linked my masculinity, my identity to the car I drive. Uh, it's welded. They're welded together. So anyway, but that's, but that's, that's some genuine a, sarcasm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's Australian sarcasm. Just oh, yeah. in case, we just need to have a little alert there. Just yeah. in case. Um, so um, I, I, we ordered it. Like it's like five months. It's going to take five months to get to mm. us. And yeah, okay. getting these like it's funny getting these little updates, these emails from Toyota, and it's like. Um, you know, it's 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 the production lines. It's like getting made somewhere. It hasn't even started being made yet. So I'm a bit worried when this is going to get to me. Um, uh, and then they'll show it being shipped out. So I'm excited to see it on a, on a container ship or something like that. But essentially that shows us how these things we, we just presumed. I can go into a car dealership and buy a car. Yeah. Now, part of the reason we can't buy a car at the moment is because what's happened is the global supply chain so just to even is currently experiencing tremendous disruption mm. okay so to help people understand this now some people and depends where you're listening particularly if you're in the united kingdom this has been really at the news uh, as of recording i just saw um that boris has sent out the army to actually deliver fuel uh, to yeah, right. uh, petrol stations um, because they've got this uh, lack of uh, lorry drivers who drive a particular type of um, truck, which we call, we would call an Australian semi-trailer, uh, to take the fuel to um, there. But it's all the whole system's breaking down. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so before I get into that, basically imagine that the world is set up in this particular way that there is this sort of just-in-time philosophy. So, for yep. example, your coasters, um, you can order yeah. them. A factory Which can produce just, them. Just to clarify, I'm not that, like, emotionally invested in my coasters. Are you having a go at my car? <laughs> that I am I am, in, 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 I am emotionally invested in my white Toyota stock standard white Camry. One. White, yep. Yeah. Mm. Burning white. <laughs> <laughs> so people are just going to like – They'll be radiant. As I pull into, you know, the, the shopping centre car park, people will just be stunned. Wow. Yeah. yeah. They, they will – yeah. Sorry, go back to my – the coasters, uh, so, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yep. Apologies. Um, the, uh, the, the coasters, you know, y- y- you could send – via the internet, send your thing – they either have them in stock or they can even produce them very quickly. Yes, that's the and, deal. Yeah. Um, you know, and stuff would perhaps they could send in an order and stuff like that they would need would come in. So it's like this finely tuned machine. And then you also have that's production, manufacturing, and then distribution across mm. the world. You know, and this thing worked in this really uh, smooth way, mm. particularly for the last little while. Um, so, for example, is it, you know, if we were – if each of us were holding a coffee and a pastry – which we were earlier, and I passed my coffee and pastry to you, Liddy, who passed yes. it to Daniel. We could sort of keep it going in a circle there for some time. Now, if Daniel spilt his coffee and I dropped my pastry, those two mistakes will start to stop that process of passing those things on. So that's what's happening at the moment in the, glo- in the global supply chain problem. So first of all, COVID comes and there's a global shutdown. And that means that um, in certain places where there were um, production, so mm-hmm. one key place is like um, southern China where so much of the world stuff is made um, that you've had factories which have been shut down because of COVID cases. So that slows that down. And then all of a sudden you've got this perfectly just-in-time system where perhaps you've got container ships who are coming into a harbour in southern China who are going to get stuff and take it to, say, let's say Los Angeles port. But then if they're a week late – they get into Los Angeles port, port a week late. That slows this entire process down. Everything from, you know, how you get that um, container off the ship to who are the truck drivers going to drive it, it's perhaps mm. from Los Angeles to Wisconsin, you know, across the country. And all you need is a f- because, again, if people think about it, been following this podcast, this is now we're talking about complex world issues. This is problems of complexity. So what's happening at the moment is we've got COVID, but then you've also got uh, – so that slowed the world down, meant there's less um, – uh, uh, there's some uh, labour shortages in certain places. Mm-hmm. Um, you've also got people who are isolating. You've got places in the world where there's outbreaks. So you might be in a country where there's high vaccination, you sort of feel like COVID's over, but you're buying something from a place in the world which actually is having a COVID outbreak. It's still going to affect you. Mm. And um, if, you, if you look at um, uh, that issue – 
Uh, but then also you look at the fact that what happened when COVID hit was people couldn't go on cruises. They couldn't go to concerts. They couldn't go and eat at restaurants. So all that money that they had plus stimulus checks came in a lot of countries. Mm, um, mm-hmm. That then was spent on things like for your house. Yeah. So you all of a sudden buy a new TV cabinet. You buy a new computer. You buy coasters. Some coast, you buy some <laughs> coasters. Um, you buy <laughs> a Toyota Camry. Um, you buy these things because you can't spend them on other things. And then all of a sudden that then meant that there's certain things which just in time had this, you know, like you think how much they knew how much timber they would need every year. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden every man and their dog is like putting a patio out the back because no one can travel anywhere and the cost of timber goes up in the world. And so there's all these knock-on effects. So that's COVID. But then we've got environmental issues. You've got floods in certain places. Like in Germany, we've just Mm -hmm. had floods. You've got uh, increased sort of natural disasters happening in the world. You've got something like geopolitical things like Brexit, which is happening. So Britain, what Britain is experiencing is about COVID, but it's also about Brexit. And, you know, it's multiple things. It's also about, you know, there's there's, uh, some of the environmental stuff is playing into energy stuff in Europe and gas. So something in Europe can then bounce into this complex system and bounce throughout the world. We've also got this thing where what's happening is the globe is aging and particularly many developed economies are aging. So there's actually less of a labor, uh, you know, there's less people working that's happening and Mm -hmm. COVID saw a lot of people retire. Um, And so you've also then got China, which is starting to, which has been producing all this really cheap stuff for people, but it's starting to decouple from the world. Mm -hmm. And so China is now encouraging people not to buy stuff from overseas. And because China's in a sense been slightly more confrontational on some issues around the world, particularly the South China Sea and Taiwan, uh, it actually means that as if China changes, that's going to affect what's happening in Vancouver. Yes. Because there's tremendous uh, uh, investment in a place like Vancouver. So what we're seeing is we're seeing something that if you go back to our Networked World series, we talked about the shift from centralised hubs yep. to this networked. We're literally seeing this happen in real time. And, and what we did learn in that series was that increased complexity of networks leads to greater chaos. And what happens is something like COVID can then cascade into crises. So the UK mm. – um, you know, had Freedom Day, opened up, they got to high levels of vaccination, but then that's cascaded now into perhaps while they might be feeling like they're getting affected by the virus as much, they're all of a sudden getting affected by supply chain issues yes. because crises then join up with each other. So some of the effects of Brexit are joining with COVID and so we see these cascades of crises. Yeah, okay. Now, we're not just seeing this in the supply chain um, we're also seeing this, yes, again, as of recording, yesterday Facebook was down, Instagram was down, mm. and we're also seeing this in the electronic digital world. So, you know, some people call this the digital pandemic. So what this means is we're going to be living in a world where there's a lot more um, uh, these sort of cascading crises that go through both our physical structural world networks and also our digital networks. Okay, so that's that's a pretty... Uh, big view of what's what's happening across the world, but I'm interested in finding out what what does what are the implications for us as a church? What does it yeah. mean for the contemporary church yeah. and the way that we operate? Are we being disrupted in how we can operate yes. or how we have operated? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Yeah. Well, Go I think for it. I think one thing that characterised that sort of thirty year period of high efficiency world mm-hmm. is. Um, that it was smooth, that we expected things to work smoothly. Hey, I want to go to that conference um, that church is putting on on the other side of the country. Oh, I'm going to be able to do that. Um, I want to order that book set, um, you know, for, um, you know, the study group that we're going to do. Oh, it's in England. I'll just order it, you know, and it's going to be here in a week. Yeah. Um, so we used to everything working very smoothly. We're used to being able to do church programs in a smooth manner mm-hmm. um, often. Really the only problem is sort of the people, you know, like issue. We're not, we're, we're not used to the idea that um, disruption is now the new norm. So we've moved from a smooth world to an increasingly disruptive world. Now what's really important to make at this point is often when you talk about these issues, people interpret it through a lens of apocalypse, so there's this deep mm. cultural vein of if anything goes wrong in the world, it's going to end up like the Walking Dead zombie apocalypse type scenario. Mm. This is I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's not going to be it, – but it, it's going to be disrupted. So it's more that the smooth world mm. is perhaps passing, but we're moving to more of a disrupted, unpredictable pattern. Um, 
And so this is actually going to affect, um, I think, you know, certain church models, how we do church. Um, so if you think about it, you know, think about the contemporary church in many ways, the form that it's taken in the last sort of 10 years has been one which is, in a sense, uh, shaped itself in reaction to what's happening in the culture. You've got people who expect more, um, individuals who expect more from their churches. They expect more programs, more options, more services, Mm -hmm. uh, a greater level of sort of uh, technical proficiency in the services. Uh, People come less, but they expect more. They want programs for their kids. You know, so the the contemporary church model in many ways has mirrored what's happening in the economy and has, you know, like just as we had big box stores like, you know, Walmart in the US or Bunnings here in Australia, um, you saw churches which began to look like big boxes um, and very similar thing, running lots of programs, lots of options for people. Here's the men's breakfast. Here's this event for singles. You know, here's this stuff for your kids, you know, six to seven, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, but what's really interesting is that the pandemic was the first sign that that stuff could be quite significantly disrupted mm. because you couldn't meet together. And already the future is looking, you know, we have here in Australia um, or in Victoria where we are, um, you know, you're looking forward to that. Things are going to return to normal soon as we hit, you know, 80% um, vaccination uh, rates um, and things will open up. But there's a cap on how many people can come. Yeah. And, you know, the idea of let's just have, you know, 5,000 people in an arena, um, that may still be happening in some people who are listening to this in certain places. But there's a lot of other places where that's going to be really hard going forward Mm -hmm. because, you know, if the virus is around for the next couple of years. But again, too, even when the virus passes, what we're also seeing is that COVID has seen this break point. There's a tremendous break point with how people are thinking about how they work and live. We've seen a move around the world of people moving from cities to regions, yep. which is being facilitated by e-work, um, uh, by transport networks, again, as the sort of network goes out. And we're seeing things like the Great Resignation, where uh, there are people, uh, you know, Terry Walling mentioned this um, last uh, week uh, in terms of pastors, but we're seeing this uh, all across the workforce. Uh, I saw some stats this week in Australia alone, four out of 10 people are considering leaving their jobs in January 2022. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's a huge change. Now, again, churches which had, um, you know, and we've experienced this, people who we saw were rusted on, who would love to still be at red, are having to move and moving interstate and making decisions around they want to buy a house, they're going to have to buy in the country and stuff like this. Mm. So the idea that contemporary churches set themselves up as these almost like hubs that people would come to and even some of the thinking around sort of multi-site, um, that's now going to move – a lot of that was responsive to the smooth world, that sort of economy where we could easily do things. Um, but now we're doing that now into a time of increased change and disruption. Now, the other thing that's happening as well, which is worth noting, is that we're also sort of connected to cultural change. So that's the structural change. But that's – again, remember cascading. You've got – Cultu- uh, you've got structural change happening that people couldn't meet because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Then people start to move churches uh, because they're moving cities and they're moving jobs. And then all of a sudden we've also got, well, not all of a sudden, but it was already sort of brewing. We've got tremendous uh, cultural disruption as well. Yeah. So you look at something like the pandemic, it's not just about how do you um, – you know, deal with the fact that perhaps you can't meet for a while or perhaps you've had your church has had a bit of an outbreak or whatever. It's now dealing with people who are seeing things like vaccines, you know, through very different lights because we're not all accessing the same media. Yep. So you've got this sort of, uh, you know, particularly I think a lot of the culture war that I've seen in America, um, which we haven't seen really in Australia throughout a lot of the pandemic, you're starting to see in some areas now because because the world's network, that's now being exported globally. Yeah. Um, or people who are in other countries. So I know people here in Australia who, um, you know, are connected culturally to China who um, were some of the, the Chinese uh, uh, government sort of uh, commentary around Western vaccines. So it wasn't like they were anti-vaccine. They wanted Sinopharm when in Australia Pfizer – Moderna and AstraZeneca are what's available. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so we're connected to these international uh, sort of cultural war issues. And so that comes into a church. And what's happening is too, if you think about the um, period that was sort of the last 20, 30 years, again, it was smooth and it was apolitical. So yeah. when everything is just continual growth, the idea sort of, and this is sort of like, if you want to get really technical, sort of neoliberalism, uh, which is an economic model, the idea was everything's going to keep growing. 
the in a sense the political problems have been solved because everyone's got enough money, everyone's got enough opportunities, everything's wonderful. And you don't really have to make political decisions. If you want to talk about politics, you talk about it from a theoretical sense. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden we say something like a vaccine and people are, oh, I've got to make a decision whether to take it. Yep. All of a sudden what that does is it actually brings politics into a personal thing. And because we live in a connected world um, and we're interconnected, whether someone takes a vaccine or not is actually going to affect other people. So what it has done is we've gone from an apolitical world, and you think about churches, you think about your contemporary church was not set up to deal with um, intense political debate. Not at all. <laughs> and, and it was just like, we're just going to run the programs. We're just going to show you how to have a great life. We're going to talk to you about Jesus and here's some basic discipleship programs and worship. And then you've got actual churches now who are absolutely struggling. Uh, they may even have enough money. They may have great facilities, but they're struggling into this new moment of disruption where there's multiple disruptions happening mm. simultaneously. And the other thing that is happening as well is that the cultural crisis is creating a crisis for cultural Christians. So a lot of the model, particularly as it's been exported from the US of contemporary church was creating a space where people could, in a sense, harvest large amounts of cultural Christians when there was sort of an alignment between a general sort of moral Christian who existed in the culture and then they could come to church. But what we've seen now as the culture has moved more into a sort of crises and cultural fractious place, particularly in the United States, that means you're seeing lots of cultural Christians leave. Mm. So yet again, that's another way in which this sort of disrupted space is actually affecting uh, churches going forward. So before we move on, I'm, I'm just curious as to whether your – so we're in this complex world where yes. disruptions occur, those disruptions bounce off one another, creating further disruptions. So we're like yes. lots and lots of ripples going out in the pool, so to speak. Do you foresee there being a point where this disruption stops and we enter a new phase of smooth like yeah. we were in or yeah. is there sort of just going to be this continual proliferation of, of disruption? I think – the world is in this really interesting moment of um, grey zone transition. Yes. So we're coming out of that world. And I think there's still, you know, you still hear the language of, oh, you know, when things get back to normal in six months. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying things are not going to get back to a kind of normal, Yeah. Um, but it's not going to look like the 2019 world. And that's not just a comment about the pandemic. That's about everything. You know, if you look at the big factors, you look at the fact that the supply chain is under tremendous pressure. Yeah. Um, and what that might mean is that people's uh, expectations have to change. And so, for example, oh, I can just order that shirt from Portugal. Maybe you can't do that anymore. Maybe there's going to be less stuff in the shops. Um, if you look at where you can travel in the world at the moment, um, it's interesting. Australia has been cut off from the rest of the world with travel. And I looked up this thing and it was a really interesting website. It was like, where can you travel if you're a Canadian? Where can you travel if you're an EU citizen? Where can you travel as Australian? Even countries which say, oh, we're flying, we're doing stuff. There's actually, you can't travel everywhere like you once yeah. did. It's actually still really limited. And, um, you know, what this is going to look like with the European winter coming, it's going to be very, really interesting. So the idea that you're in this smooth world where you've got multiple options, that's changing very rapidly. Um, so I think there will be a recalibration mm -hmm. where what you might see, if you think about it this way, like, for example, you know, we um, uh, there's increased tension in the world over Taiwan and um, you have this um, sort of confrontation in trade war um, increasingly between sort of Western countries and Taiwan, uh, sorry, and, and Republic of China. Um, now, what's really interesting is that people are realising that the supply chain world worked when no one was that concerned about nationalism and no one was that concerned about local interest and sort of the almost the old religions, if you like, of sort of land and um, mm -hmm. nation. Now that that's back in vogue, do you do you want? Would you want to go into business with someone who could end up sort of declaring war on you? Is a really interesting sort mm. of dynamic. So all of a sudden, you've got all these countries who, who don't trust each other like they did 10, 15 years ago. And so there is this decoupling. I can see a future where people manufacture more stuff at home. Yep. Where perhaps the people are working out how to secure the supply chains. Um, but it's going to take a while. I mean, it's a, that's a 10, 15, 20 year thing. 
So I think we're, we're moving to a period, I don't think this is just a one or two year thing. I think we're yeah. moving to a period of disruption for some sort of period of time um, is the reality of where we're going. Just to add one more thing to on the church thing to help sure. people understand it this way. We gave before the example of the industrial revolution to the sort of feudal system. Mm-hmm. And just to look at how church works. So if you think about it, um, you had in the sort of feudal system, you'd had your um, sort of local parish church because people didn't have cars, you yep. know, you'd walk to. Um, and then you might have something where there might be a Catholic one and there might be a Protestant one because of the you know, Reformation. Yep. People would have pilgrimages to that. So you might walk every month or once a year to the cathedral in the bigger city. Yes. You know, yeah. So there was that sort of dynamic. Um, and then you think about cities begin and um, all you know, cities were already existing, but you know, industrial revolution begins. And all of a sudden these people move from the country, they find themselves in the city, and then there's all of a sudden multiple churches. But if you look at some cities, like if you look at cities in the in you know, if you look at London or you look at cities in the US and even some of the, the churches uh, in Melbourne's downtown, they're bigger. So it's this idea of people would catch the train into to the city or there was high population in the city. So these bigger churches downtown and also these flagship churches. But then when the car kicks off and they're sort of the move out to the suburbs, that's when you sort of have the suburban churches. Mm. And But they were still sort of like in Australia, they were often sort of 150, you know, people still wanted to be local in their community. But then as people travel more for shopping, for school, for work, you then have these mega churches because people are happy to travel half an hour. Yes. Now, it, that, my, the point I'm making, that's what we're used to, that model, that's about to change. Um, and it's not just about digital, that people are looking online digitally, but that there's actually going to be greater disruption and more movement and it's going to be harder to, to, to run things in the smooth way that we ran them before. Okay, so in this sort of space of a great deal of change and not exactly knowing where it's going to land, what are the opportunities that we have as leaders to take steps forward, to lead well um, and I guess lead cultural change Yeah, when all the structures are looking pretty shaky. Yeah. I, I think one of the key things, I, I remember when I first came into ministry, one of the hardest things to do was to communicate the gospel to those who were without faith and to communicate to discipleship to those with faith who were mired in radical individualism. Mm-hmm. There's a sense like, hey, I can do what I want. There's not a lot of consequences in the world. A connected world is a complex world, is a consequential world. And so we're now seeing the consequences of our actions. Mm. Um, The fact that we can have this wonderful life because the costs are actually put on people in other countries or the environmental costs are put on people in other countries. So, for example, you know, we can buy cheap laptops or cheap coffee beans because actually – um, that's made in a country which doesn't have the same labor laws as us. If all this stuff was made in Australia, it would actually cost us a lot more. Yes. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, through the pandemic, through I think these supply chain issues, that we're deeply connected to the rest of the world. Now that undermines individualism. Mm. <laughs> uh, what is happening through the pandemic and through cultural war stuff and happening through supply chain issues is that the mythology of individualism is really being subverted at the moment. We are far more deeply connected and we actually have less autonomy than we realise. And so there's this sense that there's a lot of people having that sense of autonomy or agency panic because they're realising like, hang on, I'm not as in control of as much stuff as I thought. Um, So there's an evangelistic opportunity in that. So we're going to see possibly people move down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So people are going to move from, you know, what am I going to do this year? Am I going to go to Vietnam on an eco holiday? Or am I going to buy those shoes from Greece or whatever, where people now I think are actually going to, there's a, there's a huge, and it's happening slowly and it's not everyone, but there's a, a great, the fact that people are making decisions around leaving their jobs show there's a great revaluing happening. Mm. People are repositing their values in the world. That's a huge discipleship opportunity. That's a huge evangelistic opportunity. The second thing I would say to, to, to leaders at this moment is now's the time to recalibrate. Mm. Politicians, business leaders around the world, the smart ones, are already looking at the changes that are happening to the supply chain. They're looking at what's happened with COVID and they're recalibrating and planning now for a very different world. Yes. Um, and, you know, when I wrote my book, I read a lot of this stuff and, like, the, the best thinkers are like, we're entering a very different world. We have to change. We have to recalibrate now. Um, things are not going to go back to normal as we thought they were. 
Um, and part of that as well is that uh, if you think about the contemporary church model, the contemporary church model defined itself as the model which changed from traditional church. If you read all the contemporary church model books, they're all talking about, oh, yeah, I grew up in this traditional church or when people did it in traditional churches. Okay, be really careful because you may be the next traditional churches <laughs> um, when the world changes because the contemporary church model was adapting to cultural changes happen and cultural change is happening now, structural change is happening now. And so the danger is there's a, there's a, there's a time of recalibration and for leaders to revalue um, how we've become attached to models. One thing about models, models work until they don't. Hmm. And models work in particular seasons because they, they respond to something happening in the environment. When the structure and the environment changes, you need to look at a new model. And people hear that and there'll be a bunch of people like, oh, good, he's going to now tell us. The contemporary church model is going to be disrupted. So Mark is now going to outlay for us. The, the new. The new. Okay, so get your pens. <laughs> this is the new model of church. It's going to work in every context in the world and just bring you massive ministry success the Toyota Camry model. Um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the, there isn't a model yet because what God tends to do is before the next model comes, we have to put, we have to hold the model that we have before God and almost put it on the altar. Say, okay, what is part of this that is part of the last season? What part of this has even become an idol? And there is a huge recalibration moment happening with a contemporary church model, with contemporary church leadership, Terry Walling led us through part of that last week. Yeah, um, There is a huge model that even if leaders are not rethinking the model, people in the pews are. And that's some of the reason why people are deconstructing things, leaving churches. There is a huge rethinking of the model that we, I guess the prime, let's call it the 2019 was its peak um, that's going on. But every time that happens, there's also an invitation as you place it on the altar before God, what, what, what's still of worth here? What's from the last season? What's an idol? But every time you put down a model, you're again invited to find models often emerge. The best kind of models emerge from an inquiring and a seeking after God. Yeah. And that's the actual starting point. So when the model isn't working anymore, that's a chance to connect ourselves with the maker of all things mm. who leads us and created us to be creative, innovative beings to come up with the next model. So in a sense, this is not a. This is the first point of call here is not a problem solving place. It's a reconnecting with in our intimacy with God as the originator of all creative thought, and so that, that's best when I think they're reconnected uh, at this model. And Terry spoke about last week, you know, of moving from a model of just trying to get attenders to apprentices mm -hmm. um, from this sort of mass to a remnant. Um, from sort of consumer church model to a disciple church model. Um, I think the model is going to come from those spaces. But what's going to happen in the world is there's going to be a bunch of leaders who reconnect with God in intimacy and through the innovation and creativity of finding, you know, working that out with God in their context, new models will emerge. Um, but we're at the beginning point of that process. I think of the, like um, in the Gospels, Jesus's question about fasting, and he kind of then talks about like new, like don't put an old, a new patch on an old mine skin. Um, no, uh, jacket or something. Oh, jacket, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And then yeah, then he goes on about um, uh, old wine into a new wine skin type of thing. Is this kind of like when you like talking about models? Is this something we can kind of tie against what Jesus is talking about? Uh, yeah, I, I think it, I think this is a sort of new wineskins mo moment, and and I think that at this moment it can feel really disorientating if your identity and value and worth and success is connected to how well a model was working, and when that model doesn't work, and I think these these models were not fully working even before the pandemic came and mm -hmm. supply chain. It's more that they're just feeding us back what's happening. And in a sense, like if you think about a contemporary church, it's like a supply chain world. And as the world gets more complex, it becomes more complex to run them. Now, is there going to be ways of doing church that emerge for the future? 100%. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it's it's the key is Jesus and being close to him. Mm. Mm. And, and that's a renewal moment. And again, we come back to the classic mantra, crisis precedes renewal. Um, but I think for those who are, who are finding themselves uh, – disillusioned at this moment, 
I think there's a real invitation to reframe this moment. I think some of the just most innovative, wonderful, cool models are going to emerge <laughs> in yeah. the next sort of 10 years. Um, but in order to do that, we have to accept where we are and we have to actually say goodbye to smooth world. And particularly, I just want to say too, there's possibly leaders listening to this who are younger and all you've known is smooth world. Mm. And, and you've been told you're going to do ministry and it's going to be fantastic and here's the model, just replicate that and, and it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be all successful. And you're sitting there going, mate, oh, my goodness, like this, this is not a smooth world. This does not feel fun. And perhaps a lot of your friends have left, but actually it's in these moments of discomfort mm. that incredible creative things are birthed. Um, but we've just got to go on that process, reconnect back with with God. And I think the models that are going to come forward are going to balance growth and resilience. Yeah, I think the church growth model, the problem with it was just like the model in the world. The, the problem in the world is endless growth is getting us in trouble. It has an environmental price. It has a supply chain price. Um, you look at the, the way that the, the pandemic is gr- a gr- you know, unlimited growth in a sense is cancerous. Mm. And so what we need to do is we need to balance growth and resilience. We need to balance a, something growing far but also deep. Um, so I think that's what the, the emerging models are going to uh, come from. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, yeah, so much wisdom um, to the way that you've reflected on what's happening or what the implications are for churches um, when we're looking at supply chains. Who knew that the two could be connected? Yes. Mm. Uh, so really appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who are part of our mailing list, you'll be expecting something in your inbox if you haven't already. Uh, and if you're not part of our mailing list, you can join by going to rebuilders.co. You can also uh, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and you can... Write what? something nice. Oh, you can write something nice. Yes. yes. <laughs> yep. You can write something nice. And yeah, we'll catch you next time. 